Okay. So, thank you. You're still here. Fantastic. And you are lucky last, actually, because this is going to be an incredibly exciting talk. I've already tell. I can already tell. Um, so, Daniel Severa is here to talk to us about practical applications of using AI and comes from an incredible background, which I'm sure you'll tell us about. Um, I believe you should all be taking lots of notes for this, especially if you want to learn specific, <laughs> specific tools. So, thank you, Daniel Severa. Thank you. No pressure at all to compete with the hype. <laughs> well, hi, welcome. Uh, as Maya said, my name is Daniel Severa, or Dan uh, for short. Uh, I'm uh, a marketing creative director with uh, 20 years of history as a VFX supervisor in film and television industry. Uh, so pretty much uh, how you could summarize me is that my focus is just to create something visual in general in many different tools and many different softwares and many different ways imaginable. Before I start and move on to, I first of all want to uh, thank uh, Maya and, and Peter and in fact the whole PSU faculty for giving me this opportunity to talk to you guys today, so thank you very much. In fact, when we met with Maya for the first time a couple of months ago, we started talking about you know, me maybe talking to you guys a little bit about AI and the ways we could adapt it. And so Maya said, well, can you just you know, draft something up? Me being me, I came home and what I drafted up was a three year long syllabus of, of me teaching you everything that I, I, I think is important. So when we met again, Maya said, oh my God, it's great, that's so exciting. Now, could you shorten it to 90 minutes? <laughs> well, here we are. So uh, these, these 90 minutes or 60 to 90 minutes, something, uh, is going to be probably very chaotic. Uh, I'm going to fail in many ways, and I'm going to claim that it's by design. Uh, but what I hope that I will achieve, and what I hope I, will, I won't fail at, is, well, first of all, to uh, give you some practical, concrete, specific advice into how you can actually implement AI and AI tools in your daily lives, and which tools you could watch out for, and which you tools are worth of implementing right now, and which maybe are better to just watch out for in the future. Uh, and second of all, and I'd even say more importantly, uh, uh, I want to talk a little theoretically and uh, philosophically. I, I don't really want to use the word following up Micah, I'm not going all the way there, but I do want to uh, explain why this pompous title? Uh, because I think that we should be rethinking our role as uh, artists and as creators and digital creators in the modern world of artificial intelligence. And that's the point of today's, uh, today's talk. Now, it's going to be a little different. When I said at the beginning that it's going to be a little chaotic, what we're going to do is I'm going to try um, right here with you guys together to create uh, an advertising campaign. Uh, and by the end of this lecture, the advertising campaign should be ready. Now, I, uh, when I was thinking about what the advertising campaign, yeah. You can't, you can, but it's not going to be about advertising. Uh, <laughs> the reason why we are creating advertising campaign is because I think it's the easiest thing, easiest process, or the easiest to show all kinds of different um, tools that we can use in a very, very short amount of time, very efficiently. So the campaign that we want to create uh, is a campaign to promote pet adoption. And uh, and promoting pet shelters. Uh, so if you want to participate in this, I would like to ask you to scan this QR code as most of you are already doing. That's gonna take you to a Dropbox link. And after you put down your email, um, I would like to ask you to upload one photo of your pet or of any pet that you have. Uh, the photos are gonna work better if they are vertical, by the way. It's better vertically than horizontally because I expected that most of your photos of your pets are just taken vertically. Uh, and and, and we, want to, we want to use these pictures and create a, an, a commercial or a social media commercial that utilizes these pictures. So these pictures will, if you upload them, they will be made public. I want to, after we're done, I want to publish this campaign. 
Um, as a thank you uh, to, to all of you, I'm actually donating uh, the fees that I'm getting for today's lecture fully into this campaign, so that's what's financing this. Uh, and this is gonna be up there for a while, no rush. Uh, I'm gonna leave it up there and talk for a while. Uh, I want to talk about why I'm, I am here, why it's not somebody else. Uh, and why I feel that I have something to say. Because by far I can't claim that I'm an expert in AI or a master in AI. There are two reasons for, for, for that, for why I can't claim it. The first being, well, there's way too many people who are way better and smarter than me. Uh, and it would be really pompous of me not to say this, so I have to. Uh, the second reason is I believe that nobody can actually master uh, AI. Uh, that we're living in time uh, where technology, and especially all technology surrounding artificial intelligence, is simply evolving so incredibly fast and in so many different places at once that I believe there is not a single person in the world who can claim I can be surprised by anything. I can expect everything that's going to happen. Uh, and we see it all the time. Uh, we're simply, uh, when, you, when, you, when you listen or if you follow any AI news, you see that pretty much every couple of weeks, some news come out that, that say, hey, nobody, nobody expected this. This, this OpenAI just announced something that killed off thousands of startups. That's literally what's actually happening. You have these thousands of people investing billions of dollars into being sure that they are following the right steps and then somebody just does click and it always appears because the evolution is that fast, it's that insane. Uh, so why me if I'm saying I'm not an expert. Well, what I am is somebody who needs a challenge in life. Uh, I spend most of my life and most of the work that I do lucky enough that I have clients and crazy colleagues, some of whom are sitting here, thanks for coming, who support me in just adapting new technology just because we can, because we can try something. So most of the work I've done in my life, uh, even though it was commercial, even if, uh, when it was on tight deadlines, most of it actually utilized something new. Most of it had some innovation in it, adapting new technology. That also means that I was lucky enough that I was actually able to experiment practically and commercially uh, with generative AI tools pretty much since the dawn of the, since they were kind of viable. I would date that to let's say 2019. Those were, it was like the first year where there was technology. You could kind of use it if you were smart enough and if, uh, and if you, know, you operated well enough with it. So since 2019, I've been using uh, generative AI tools very actively and searching actively for them around. Uh, for the past year and a half, generative AI is completely my day job. It's, it's, it's part of everything I do. And uh, all those tools that a lot of you use, you know, ChatGPT, MidJourney, those are things that are, that are really my basic tools of trade for a year and a half and many, many more. So what I think that I can kind of do because of this experience is I believe I can uh, claim that I know which tools are here to stay and which methods are actually applicable and uh, which are there for us to use right now and which are not there yet, but we can expect them to be there very, very soon and we're gonna work with some of them and show, show, show some of those uh, today. Uh, and I also believe that I can kind of guess uh, what are the tools that are not there by far, but we can pretty much expect them. That's not necessarily part of this talk, but it's something that maybe we can chat about after if we have a little time left. Uh, so now I want to talk a little bit. Um, before we get to image generation, video generation, which is gonna be the major part probably of this talk, I want to talk a little bit about large language models. Because certainly, I'd say maybe even every single person in this room uh, has at least a couple times used ChatGPT, right? Uh, probably a lot of you are using it daily, uh, as your daily tool. Uh, and there's a lot of discussion 
on what's the approach, how, how should people use it, uh, why is it giving me wrong answers, how, why is it hallucinating, why, why, why is it that it claims that it knows everything and it knows nothing, you know, uh, why can I utilize it properly and am I actually stealing somebody's prop property using it. I think that's an important conversation and I think that I'm, I'm combining these two topics because I think that the answer is the same, that when you're understanding how the technology works, it actually helps you get towards the answer of how you should use it and how you could use it ethically. Uh, and then we're going to start talking about it um, through the large language models and then we're going to move over to the image generation when it's, become, it's going to become a little bit more clear. So, uh, we are going to take a look at how ChatGPT works right now and we're going to take a look at tools that are utilizing GPT. Now, ChatGPT is by far not the only large language model uh, available right now. It's not even the only one that's available easily. Uh, just yesterday, was it? Uh, Google announced Gemini, uh, which they claim, well, now we finally fixed BART. Uh, so so it's, it is very exciting. It is, it is very exciting because they are doing something new. Uh, but besides that, there's many, many large language models that are open source and that are available to developers uh, all around the world. And many, many very interesting projects are built uh, upon those. But we are going to be focusing on ChatGPT simply because it's very approachable. It's there. Most of you are using it. You know, everybody knows it. And it is a great tool. Uh, and anything that you can understand about ChatGPT is applicable to pretty much any other large language model. So now. Uh, we're, we're gonna use it for, we're gonna use it very simply today, but we're gonna use it in uh, a little clever way, or let's say the right way. Uh, what we want to do is, uh, well, we wanna launch a campaign for, to support bed shelters, right? So we should know something about them. We should, we should know what are the advantages of uh, adopting a pet instead of buying from a breeder. Maybe we should know what kinds of people potentially would buy those, right? We, we, we want to do this research and this, this brainstorm and this idea making process, this whole mishmash that, you know, happens uh, whenever you develop anything, you know. Uh, you sit down with people, with your colleagues, you discuss everything, you do your research, uh, which, well, nowadays, up until NHGPT was here, what, what did we do, right? If I wanted to research something, I spent a bunch of hours on the internet. Right, and I got all the inspiration. I wasn't just getting the information, I was even getting the inspiration. I was looking at other people's um, uh, marketing campaigns about ox shelters, for example, you know. I was, uh, I'm looking at something that inspires me, that I don't want to necessarily copy, but I wanted to spark an idea. Uh, before we did that with the internet, that pretty much gives us everything right away. What we did when I was a kid was we actually went to a library, right? In the library, there were actually books that were books of inspiration. You, you literally have books that are just filled with images. You know, I, I started as a web designer when I was like 12. So I, I owned a bunch of these books that actually had screenshots of websites in them and nothing else, just for inspiration. So this whole phase of ideation and brainstorming and inspiration and research is pretty much one big thing combined, right? just the same way as the GPTS. It's your huge, or any other language model, it's your huge library, but it is not. Because the problem is that when you're talking to GPT, when you ask it a question, it doesn't know the answer. There's no huge library. And it says, who are you? Are we having a conversation? No. Because it has short context of memory. Now, this, this context size is changing a lot. And that's the big difference right now between if you're using the free version of ChatGPT and many other models, and when you're using the paid version of ChatGPT. Because when you're using the free version, the context size right now is, I believe, I, I think it's 8,000 tokens now. It, it grows kinda, it's better now. But so 8,000 tokens, that means, well, tokens are kinda words, but it's less. So 8,000 tokens is about 5,000 words. Now, that's actually pretty good. That's enough 
to, to give GPT a summary of a couple articles, you know, and have a short conversation with it. But the longer the conversation, the more words you say in that conversation. And it can only remember 5,000 words at once. So the longer you talk to it, eventually, usually very fast, you get to the point where it just starts forgetting the beginning, you know? That's when, at the start, when you say, I'm Dan, you know, and you talk to it whole night, then it says, hey, Jacob, how are you doing? Uh, because it's losing the context. Now, in the paid version, uh, this was an important topic in paid version a couple weeks ago also, but a couple weeks ago, OpenAI said, no, now we're announcing that we have the context of 128,000 tokens, which is by far most than anybody else in the world. It's so huge that you can fit a whole book in it. That's the thing. Now, now you can give it the whole Ogilvy book into the conversation and just speak to it. Now, that's huge. That's groundbreaking. That you can actually feed it sufficient data and it can become a relevant partner in conversation. But you need to do it. You can't rely on thinking that it knows something. It knows nothing. You have to help it out. So we're going to take a look at it a little bit now. How long have I been talking? When did I start? Uh, 3.20. 3.20. OK, so I'm already behind. Uh, so I'm going to show you two tools that are important to do this. Uh, one of them is what we're looking at right now. This is a sidebar in my Google Chrome that's called Harpa AI. This is what's called an agent. And there's many agents programmed. Uh, but Harpa is just something that's been around for a while. It's well made. It's open source, kind of. So there's a lot of things that people add, a lot of different functions. But the difference between Harpa and uh, ChatGPT, well, especially the free one, but any ChatGPT by itself, is that it operates inside the window in the context of what you're doing. So first of all, I can tell Harpa, well, find me a great website about the advantages of adopting where am I? Adopting a pet from a shelter. It's really hard writing standing up, actually. <laughs> Adopting a pet from a shelter, I guess. All right. So, uh, so what it does is it went on Google. It Googled stuff. It found some information. Now it's giving me any information, you know, kind of summarizing it. And it's showing me the sources where, it's, where it got it. So now I can actually go on the website. Uh, and honestly, this doesn't actually work quite often. No, it does now. Fine. Just the internet's slow. But so what I would do now is that I would go to the website, and I will open up Harpa again. Uh, and, and I would maybe even ask it further questions. I would say, OK, pick me the you know, three most important um, uh, articles on this blog. Now summarize them to me, you know, stuff like that. We're not going to waste time doing it right now. But this is you know, the important step. You're still doing the research. You still have to do the work. Now you have an assistant that helps you with that a lot. It helps you tremendously. It makes it really, really, really fast and really efficient if your internet works. But, uh, but you're still doing the research. You're still guiding it. You still, you still know what you need. You know? Well, yeah, you can go and ask GPT, well, what do I need if I want to do a market? You can do it, and it can visualize them. So whenever you want to work with any statistics, for example, code interpreter is your way. Now, of course, it's also great for programming and stuff like that, but its main power is in understanding actual math and understanding relationships between data. Uh, so sure, why not? And, but what we're really uh, interested in is upload files. Now, we have this file, adopt, which we said we're going to claim that has 40 pages of research in it, right? So. Now, we did that. Now, you can create an action. That's a whole other topic, but it's very powerful. You can actually have GPTs that control your calendar, write your emails, send you text messages, all kinds of stuff. All you need to do is um, combine your, or, or connect your 
OpenAI account with Zapier account, and then you can pretty much uh, have ChatGPT do all your, at least all your assistant work. So, okay, so now we created this whole thing, safe. We can make it public. Uh, this, by the way, they are gonna be, going to be opening something that they call GPT Store, and you will be actually able to sell this and market this. So I'm just gonna say only me. Why doesn't that work? That's weird. Oh, what can be empty? GPT name. You named yourself. Whatever. Let's name it the same. Oh. All right. So now we created GPT. And that what it does, it's advisor marketing for pet shelters, right? So now I have it right here. And when I click on it, I'm talking to it. And this is where I would ask the questions. Now, if you didn't have AI PRM installed, it's just kind of taking over now, you would actually see those recommended questions here. And so this is pretty much the presentation for it. Now, yes, we could ask those questions and have it you know, help us design the campaign, but we're rather going to move on and don't waste that much time on it. But this is very, very strong. I, I want to stress this. Uh, really, these, these changes that OpenAI meant, uh, made mean that this, this incredible powerful tool is in the hands of everybody. You, you see how fast I did it, and I'm pretty sure there was not a single step any of you missed, because it's so easy. But you're getting your own robot assistant that's a specialist in whatever you taught it to be specialist in, and it can do and assist you with all your work, and it can be your partner in life, very much just like Mika was talking about. Uh, so, anyway, let's move a little further. Uh, if you haven't uploaded your pet yet, you can go ahead. Uh, and we're going to move on a little bit. And we're going to move on to image generation. Now, uh, I want to stress one thing. I'm not going to talk about mid-journey. Well, I'm going to talk about it because I'm talking about it right now. But I'm not going to, sh I'm not going to go over mid-journey and I'm not going to show it. The reason is not that it would be a bad tool. The reason is that uh, it's a tool that's adopted by 20 million people now. Most of you who would use it are probably already using it. And there's way too many guides on the internet on what to do with it, what it can do, and so on. Midjourney is a very powerful tool. Now, I do not believe it's a tool to create a finished product. Uh, I think it's a great tool for mood boarding, for concept arting, uh, for um, brainstorming and stuff like that. I hear that a bunch of you guys are using it for storyboarding, which I guess is fine, but it's really hard because it's really hard to get a control over composition and over replacement of figures. And while you can get consistent characters, it's not that easy. There are way better tools for that. And while we're not going to go over storyboarding, we are going to be looking at one very, very soon. Uh, and I think that if you guys have never seen Stable Diffusion, uh, I'm going to blow your mind right in a couple of minutes. Because it's me. It's going to be minutes, not seconds, obviously. So, but before we get to that, I said that once we move to image generation, I'm going to talk a little bit more generations. And when, when it does something, that's still noise, but maybe as ears. I'm like, that's kind of dark, you know? And then when it gets worse, I slap it again. When it gets better, I'm like, yeah, you're doing well. And, and very soon, I can teach it to, to make a dog. Now, uh, what, what's this actually similar to is the first, the first neural networks that we experience daily in our daily lives without necessarily debating it that much uh, was, were OCR systems. You know, when you put paper in your scanner, uh, it scans the paper and it uh, spits out text that you can actually edit, right? Now, the OCR system also doesn't know that A is an A and man is a man, right? Sometimes it sees a man and because the scan is kind of bad, you know, it wouldn't recognize the A by itself. But because it sees man, and it kind of knows, yeah, it's a man, it recognizes, well, what, what's usually before that is an A, right? That's similar to how we talk about how ChatGPT works, right? It just, it, it just thinks about what's likely. 
Now, this is the same thing, you know, and if I just slap it uh, over and over, you know, and give it an okay over and over, it just kind of learns that it doesn't know what a dog is, it's just still a bunch of random noise for it, but it just knows, well, I, he said okay when I did this set of random numbers, you know? So it learns concepts. It doesn't learn uh, things that we wouldn't teach it. Um, so for example, when if you guys, some of you know what a negative prompt is, there's this you know, huge thing that people are using negative prompts like extra fingers, which, which means like, don't give me extra fingers. AI doesn't know what extra finger is because nobody probably ever taught her extra fingers, right? Uh, but but by understands concepts and it's how you work with the with, with AI, uh, so it's trained on the data, but that doesn't hold the data. Now, once the AI understands these concepts, once it knows what a photo is, once it's one one knows what a dog is, what a cat is, that's when I get to the point where yeah, I can take this you know pretty much done AI model, and I can train it further. And I can make 60 screen grabs of a Wes Anderson movie, show it to it, you know, and train the model more and say, well, this is Wes Anderson. And then I can ask it, well, and generate a dog that looks like it's from a Wes Anderson movie. And that's where we're getting to the problem, right, a little bit. That's, that's when we're getting to the idea that maybe we're stealing, we're stealing somebody's style. Now, I'm not going to answer this question today. That I, I can't. But I think that it's important to know enough about how, what, what the, how the tool works so that you can make your own decision, so, so that you can decide how you're going to use the tool. Uh, I think that you can use the tool in three different ways. You can either use it like I just said. You can, you can, you can talk to GPT and say, well, write me a book uh, that's like by Stephen King. You, know, you can give it a bunch of Stephen King novels and say, write me a Stephen King novel. Uh, and it will, and, and, and it might, with that tweaking, it might actually be pretty good, and you can publish it, nobody's going to be the wiser, right? So that's one way you can use it. Uh, the second way you can use it is you can be vague. You can just leave all the work up to the AI. So, so you just write me a book. Maybe you can say, write me a book that people will like, you know? And then you can sell it and profit on it, and nobody will be the wiser. And there's a third way that we, I think, already started with doing all this research and everything, right? The third way is that you actually know what you want. The third way is that you're using the tool to express yourself, to express your ideas, your vision, your process, your research, to actually you know, spend time and talk to the AI and use it as a tool like you would use any other. Now, honestly, I think all of those three approaches uh, are worthy of using at some point. For example, if I'm going to be looking for uh, ideas, you know, of course it's great that I can say, you know, generate me, you know, my scene in the style of Wes Anderson because I kind of want to see what it's going to look like. Maybe that's going to give me an idea. That's, that's a good thing. But, uh, but if I use it to generate final product, I don't think I'm expressing myself. I don't think uh, I'm standing in the role of a digital creator. I don't think I'm standing in the role of an artist. I'm just standing in the role of somebody who's you know, using it. Uh, it doesn't mean that I'm using it well. Uh, is it wrong to use it that way? I don't know. That's, that's, that's up to you. Uh, so I'm going to get to these guys later. Uh, so we're. Yeah. That's a very complicated question that I do, want, do not want to open right now. Do not want to open. I mean, the whole world is arguing it right now. You know, many people would tell you that um, it's a couple months ago, uh, some judge in um, the, the States created a precedent where he actually decided that, no, you cannot, use co you, you cannot own copyright to a work that you um, created with AI. Now, the thing is that this is such a, such a vague claim that I think there's no way it can stand. Uh, and my personal opinion is that of course you can, because it's a tool, but, but that's my personal opinion. 
Uh, so, and the conversation is endless, I think, yes? Uh huh. Yeah, that actually makes sense. Then, and, and, and when, when you say that, then it kind of answers the question in, in the whole of, no, other way, right? If, if AI can be liable, then how could it hold copyright? Or how could you not hold copyright if you are liable for the work, right? But yeah, it's... it's it, Yeah, this, but the, the, this is exactly what shows that it's just a complicated topic, that we're just not, not there yet to make that decision. Um, anyway, image generation, yes? No, it, uh, it's like a cat that learns how to paint, right? Uh, so it sees all these images, it's, it's been given all these images, uh, and, it, uh, and it's, been, uh, it's been taught on them, it's been trained on those images, but it doesn't actually hold the images. So when you actually ask it to paint a cat, it doesn't look at any cat. The images are only data that are used to train the AI, but once the AI is trained, at the point when you're actually using the AI, there are no images that it's looking at. Yeah, aren't the images that you're looking at when you're learning how to draw also copyrighted? Yeah, so it... No, that's the thing. It doesn't. It doesn't. It's only looking at them and learning concepts. Now, it's learning the concepts in great detail. It's not only learning that it's a dog and it's a cat. It is actually learning concepts like um, perspective, you know, like um, uh, colors, like anything. And it can, in the end, learn so much that you can give it enough particular in information or instruction so that it can uh, mimic the art uh, the, the specific art that it looked at. But it's not looking at it when you're asking for it. It's not reaching into a database. It is not. It's only being trained on it. So the images are actually not ever transferred between the owner and you as the client who's using the AI. That never happens. What's that? Yeah, it does everything from scratch. During the training, yes. During the training process, yes. But once the training is done, which is when you're using it, then no. All right. Uh, so and now we're going to see a little bit how uh, the prompting works, you know. Uh, and um, as with what we talked about GPT, the more information you give it, the more actually gets lost, right? So well, what are we going to generate? Some ideas? Horse, all right, so let's do a horse, right? So there we go. So we have four horses right here now, so we can look at it. Now we can say that it's a black horse, right? 
Uh, and, and this happens. Now we can say that it's a black horse astronaut, right? If I can spell astronaut. There we go. Uh, <laughs> all right. Uh, now, what? Cold. Okay. Uh, with a cold. Now, see, that's a great example because what's a cold? Is it temperature or is it that it's being sick? It doesn't really know what to do with that, right? So we're already. We're already being vague here. Now, it's kind of, they, they are kind of paintings. So let's do photo of A, right? So now I gave it the instruction so that it's a photo, but it's kind of losing that it's a horse. Well, I mean, it's, a, it's black. If he has cold or he's in a cold, we don't know. Uh, now, what I, want to, what I want to show with this is when you're working with uh, image generation AI, it's very important uh, what kinds of um, prompts uh, you give it and how many. Because what's uh, the trick that's quite popular quite often is that, well now, okay, let's say this is kind of what I'm getting and I'm gonna go. And it's a masterpiece. And it's award winning, and it's trending on ArtStation, and it's UHD, 8K, I don't know what. <laughs> so, <laughs> so now what's happening is that technically, yes, maybe it actually understands award winning, maybe it, but when I say masterpiece, well, probably that would be a word when you're training it that you would use with paintings, right? Not necessarily everything. So I'm giving it mixed information, and I'm giving it so many information that I'm just not getting what I want anymore. Now it gets even worse if I want, you know, more characters there, you know, I say with a cat standing next to it. Right, so yeah, that's all. That's just all jumbled, right? Now, by the way, if you're really surprised how fast this is, that's because it is. Um, and this is the power of uh, stable diffusion, because stable diffusion is a model that's um, developed by um, a company that's called Stability AI, and they have a huge mixture of different models for specific purposes. And also this is um, community powered, so there's many, many models and um, many um, other models that are called LoRa's, that's something you can stick up onto the model, that changes the way the model behaves. So you can perfect the model so that it's better at making photos, or you can perfect the model so that it's better at making paintings, or you can perfect the model so that it's faster. Uh, what we're seeing right now is what's called Stable Diffusion Turbo. It just came out last week. Now, the quality of the images, I mean, for how fast it is, it's incredible. But the quality of the images is not the best. But this is the purpose for what it's supposed to be used. You're supposed to work with it, perfect your prompt, you know, see how it re reacts in real time without spending hours and hours waiting for it to render. You know, and then you can take it and actually render a proper image, right? So we're doing the dark thing. I forgot about that. So uh, the stable diffusion. <laughs> what? Yeah. Uh, and uh, the uh, the UI that we're looking at is called Comfy UI. Uh, Comfy, the author, it's all open source, but the author, author who is called Comfy now works at Stability AI. So it's always up to date and you could pretty much say that this is the official UI that they use. So I'm gonna go a dog, uh, happy dog, running, <laughs> lush grass, right? And I have, I have a dog, right? So now, I take this, I take this prompt. I'm using Windows on, on a, a MacBook right now, so that's why I, I keep pressing different keys. <laughs> All right, so now I can go and load a different workflow here. Oh my God, it's tiny. Ah. Oh. <laughs> I guess this is it. Hopefully, all right. 
Uh, now, it's not that it needs to seem this complicated as it is. It's just that I am messy, as most VFX artists are. I go Q prompt. Oh, hold on. Hold on. We have a mistake here. Easily fixed. All right. All right, so now when I hit Q prompt, if I don't get any error, we're gonna see how actually the proper images uh, uh, in, in larger quality is being rendered. Yeah, right here, see our dock is being cal calculated here. Now it's not as fast as it used to be. This is being rendered at 1024 by 1024. Now it goes further, it upscales it, fixes it, adds some detail, and in about a minute we're gonna have a result. Yes? So you're utilizing a technique to render only a small image, you just kinda render it abstractly, and then when you build up one, you upscale it? Not necessarily. Uh, the first that we tried were, were smaller, they were 512 by 512, but I'm also using a different model, different base model, and the model itself is designed to be faster, way faster, by sacrificing quality. So it's not just about the resolution, it's about the actual model itself works differently. Um, but but what you suggested is another way that, of course, it's how we used to do it before, well, before last week, before this happened. Uh, so yeah, there's many techniques that you can use to, to, to change your pipeline to be more efficient and faster and better, all right? Now what's happening here is that it's, it, it's mm, mm, pretty much ping-ponging back and forth. It renders the image and it says, okay, this is a good image. Now do it again and better. Now take that image and do it again and better. And when it does three times, it's just adding, it just has more detail, more clarity and everything, yes? So it's like discriminative generative approach. Yes. All right. Uh, yeah. But, uh Very smart, uh, that doesn't really apply here and it's out of the scale of this talk. Uh, but just to try to address it, what we're doing is actually that uh, we're uh, adjusting uh, the value that's called the denoise. We're telling it, uh, do it again, do it with more information, but keep most of the image and just work with some tiny details, you know, and, and the whole time keep that image in mind. And that's how we can actually guide it so, so that it looks better. All right, so now we have a dog, fine. Uh, let's go to your dogs now. So did you guys give me any dogs? Good. Oh my God, there's so many dogs here. <laughs> I, I keep saying dogs, right? Somebody gave a cat, right? I knew I was gonna do, I'm sorry. I knew I was gonna do this. I'm a dog person. and. I, when I was practicing, I'm like, you need to say cats too. You can't just keep saying dogs. But honestly, the thing is, last year I did a similar thing and I also supported some shelters with that when I opened a store where people like send me pictures of their dogs and I, try, uh, I, I made it into like these, you know, comic book looking thingies. Or maybe gonna, well, maybe not because we don't have time. Uh, but the thing is, about 98% gave me dogs, 98% of people. About 1% gave me kids, because I also offer kids, and, and the rest 1%, I, I think I got, no, it's even less than that, because I think I got about 400 dogs uh, and about 10 cats. So, yay for dog people. <laughs> so, okay. Um, now, we want something that's called PCU. Which one's the last one? Hmm, maybe this one? Maybe not? Oh, there we go. There it is. All right. That's not it. All right, so 
I'm not going to go through all the dogs today, but, oh. but, I'm sorry, but come on. Uh, hold on, that's not even, where are the dogs? <laughs> I mean, you guys gave me 30 dogs. There's not 30 of you here. <laughs> I appreciate it. So I'm not going to go over all the docs today, but I do promise you since, well, here's the hint. We're going to fail in creating a commercial in 90 minutes, okay? I am going to finish it uh, pretty much over the weekend right after this class, and I will put all your docs in there, okay? So this is, is still going to happen, uh, but uh, you're not going to see all of them here. Now, uh, that said, by the way, if you guys want, um, note down my email uh, address because I don't have contact on you. I, I know that Dropbox made, it, uh, made you to fill it out, but it doesn't get to me. So if you want to see the result, if you want to see how the ad is doing, if you want to see how your pet, dogs and cats, and maybe lizards, and I don't know, are performing there, just shoot me an email uh, and I will send it back to you and I will send you a link where you can see how it's performing. Also, if you have a specific shelter in mind that you want to support, write it in that email, uh, send me their website, and I'm going to put it in the ad. I can put multiple shelters, so that's not a problem. What? Well, the thing is, I was uh, even thinking, we're doing it in English, so it's probably better that it's out there. But there's a lot of checks here, so I'm probably going to make a Czech version and just, uh, and just launch it here, too. All right, so the dogs, right? So let's do let's do ten dogs, okay? Let's do ten dogs. Oh no, that's not here. That's here. Okay, why doesn't it write numbers? Damn. I probably have different keyboard on my Windows machine than here. Oh. Let's go analog. Oh, that doesn't work. Wait, hold on. Hold on, what am I doing wrong? Sorry. That's weird. Yeah, I don't have a pop-up, but it, it's, re it's registering the click. It just doesn't allow me to go higher, which is, oh, there we go. Huh, weird. Okay, Q. Now, while this is all calculating, that's going to take a while. We're going to actually look at a different tool, which is freaking amazing. So what we're going to look at is Runway ML. Now, I don't know uh, if Honza Burianek talked about it. Uh, he did not. Okay. So Runway ML is this magical world, world of video and VFX that everybody can have in their pocket now, pretty much. Now, what I feel is amazing about Runway ML is that it's incredibly approachable. They have incredible amount of different AI-assisted tools. And weirdly, it's actually all really good. It's not a gimmick like many other applications. Runway ML is one of the leading researchers in uh, AI research in the world. They actually cooperate with Stability AI a lot. Even though they are co competitors, they work together. That's how AI works. It connects people and world and everything. Mika would love that. So, uh, so there are so many tools that you can use. Uh, and we're definitely not going over them, uh, but check out Runway ML. Uh, it can help you with any kinds of editing and VFX and stuff like that. Now, what we are going to do is we're going to use their tool called Gen2, if I find it. Now, the worst thing about Runway ML is, well, you got to find those things. Oh, it's this huge thing at the beginning. Okay, that's why I didn't see it. So, now... Where's my finder? We're going to take on these dogs. So, so what, we do like 10 first. <laughs> Let's take a cat. <laughs> all right, all right, all right, all right, all right. So we're taking this. Is it a dog or? It's too tiny for a dog. Come on. 
<laughs> what? Yeah, it's going to be funny, a funny result. So now, so I'm just going to upload this image. I'm not going to do anything, and I'm just going to press generate. Now it's going to um, take some time, but and we're going to take that time to talk about some concepts. Hold on, I did that. I didn't do. Oh my God, I have. I don't have that much time left, right? <laughs> I always do that. I'm sorry. Uh, so. Uh, I want to talk about uh, we, um, animation and video uh, because we went over image generation a little bit. We went over large language models, and those two things are pretty much set. We're kind of like done. You know, we mastered that. So now, what's 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 next, right? Now, the obvious answer is video and animation. Uh, and the if, if you ask if it's there yet, the short answer is, well, not really. And that's what we're going to see now. However, uh, you probably saw some you know, images that were generated by AI just uh, a year ago that, that were very, very far from being a masterpiece, right? This is the exact same thing. The evolution is very, very fast. And you can totally expect that the tools that I'm showing you right now to, well, yeah, generate a video are the exact tools these specific tools that will be uh, those that are competitive and that are usable and that are applicable in practical situations. Uh, well, but at this point, not really, right? Uh, now the thing is, if you actually play with it for a while, <laughs> so whose dog is that? Yeah, I'm sorry for that. <laughs> uh, so the truth is, if you actually play around with it a little bit, you actually can get results that are kind of usable, you know, for so for some quick editing. And uh, even if you work with it a little more, we're gonna try. We're not gonna mess with the settings. We're just gonna try one more dog because there's one more thing that I want to show you. What? Do the cat. All right, where's the justice for cats? <laughs> All right. Yeah, it's a cuddly kitty. Yeah, sure, why not? Now, so uh, you can even generate videos using both of these tools. Both uh, what we saw before was also stable diffusion, or it's rather called it stable video diffusion. Uh, what? Both, actually. We are right now, we're working in Runway, and we're waiting for Stable to generate those 10 dogs. And, and we're going to take a look at them in a while. They are, they are right now, this is Stable. Oh my God, what happened? <laughs> the cat destroyed them. <laughs> yeah, the cat screwed it up. <laughs> it was doing something, so. Uh, that, that was probably my mistake because I have like this math there to fix the resolutions because I knew that a bunch of different resolutions are going to be put in and I obviously screwed up. So, uh, but something's happening. So, you can even generate from text. Uh, you can even generate with a description. So I could actually take this cat and say, oh, is it doing something? Oh, there we go. I'm generating it twice. Yeah, that's justice for cats right there, right? Uh, so I could actually uh, add a, a prompt here so I could try to instruct uh, the animation what to do, but that actually works even worse now. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to admit that that's actually cute. Uh, all right, so well, let's, okay, so let's go for it. Let's, let's download this cat, right? <laughs> All right. It could be. So now we're going to take this cat, and uh, because oh, that's cute. Uh, Oh, the internet's, and the internet's really slow. Uh, anyway, uh, so all these, all these images are going to have some artifacts. They are going to be kind of weird. And, and, if, and the, the, the thing that you can learn from that, though, is that uh, AI is a tool. 
it's not something that I just very easily instructed to just take all these animals and just do stuff with them magically, you know, and be perfect, you know. No. It's, what is that? Oh, the dog's right there. That's the paw. Okay. <laughs> Oh, happiness manager. I thought you said something different. <laughs> All right. Uh, so if we want to, you know, kind of kind of maybe fix that, we can, for example, try to stylize it. Now for that, we can try to use what's called Gen 1. That's also not confusing at all, that they have two video generation tools that are named the same and they do something different. So we have doggies on him. No, I, I promised the cat, right? Now let's, let's take something we didn't see. So we have these dogs generated here now. Oh, hold on, those are not the ones. So that's dogs. Where are the dogs? Oh, hold on, that's somewhere different. Uh, right here. And I'm gonna go right here. And it's not saving them. That's weird. I'm sorry. I changed some settings right before I went here. But nevertheless, we saw most of these, and you will see them in the result. I'm going to take the cat now. And yeah, cat's the hero. Oh my god, I hate that so much. Uh, and I'm going to put the cat here. And I have some images of stylized dogs uh, that I did last year. So I'm just going to upload the cat, and I'm going to uh, give it this image as a uh, method, as a source of style that it would use and generate, right? Now it does its thing. And, well, whatever. Let's say it's uploaded, and I click Preview Styles, and we're going to be getting it. Now, there we go. Well, I did give it a dog, though. So. <laughs> uh, that's a cat dog. Now, this, this actually usually works quite well. But again, you should pick something that's maybe a little more similar in composition, you know, and maybe it should be a cat. It would be better. Uh, but, uh, but you can use this tool to stylize something very, very easily. Now, if you actually, here's the thing, if you actually plan out, and if you actually shoot something, and you plan that you are going to stylize that shot, you know, and you paint something beforehand, you know, this is the style, and you, and you combine these two things so they actually, composition-wise, resemble themselves, you can actually achieve great, very usable results with this. Uh, so what we're showing here and trying here now is really, you know, really short and short and really fast version of what we could do with it. Uh, and there's actually, I'm, I'm really glad that we have all these fails. That's also why. It, yes. Well. Well. Uh, well, I could, I guess, sure, but um, I'd rather use it. This I would actually use more for, fi for finished product with enough planning. Okay. You know, so I would shoot the video, direct the video, you know, do everything, and then I would take the video and I would paint uh, the picture of the style that I want to apply, and I would put those two things together, and then I would have you know, a finished stylized version. Now, in, uh, when it comes to styling, what's great for mood boarding, for example, um, the runway also has uh, a like text to color grading or whatever they call it. So they actually have um, uh, a model that color grades your video based on text prompts that you give it, which is really good. And now, is it something that replaces um, uh, the colorists? No, by far not, because colorists are incredibly talented people. But I think it's a wonderful tool for a cinematographer, 
because it's a big problem that the cinematographer, the DP, very often comes you know, to the post-production house and he kind of thinks that he knows what he wants, but that he can't convey it, he can't communicate it to the colorist very, very often. He can actually use the, this you know, text-to-color grading prompt and then he, he can show him and he says, hey, this is it. This, this is actually the look I want to achieve, you know, and find the words to express himself. So, uh, I have, I had some couple other things that I wanted to show you, but I'm really, really behind. So, uh, we were getting to the point when, again, I want to admit, this was the point. The point was to show you that the AI is not here so that you can create a marketing campaign in 90 minutes. You could, if you didn't ramble as much as I do, but it probably wouldn't be that good. The point is to show you that there are tools available that you can utilize, and if you utilize them very well and very wisely, you can actually achieve incredible and very creative results and express yourselves in, in amazing ways. Uh, to me, this is something I'm going to just put the... Oh, we didn't see the animation, right? So, yeah, surprisingly enough, it's really weird. Uh, so... But nevertheless, I will take the pictures of those, all those pets, all those cats and dogs, and I will finish it. And uh, if you guys send me that email, I will send it over. Uh, so uh, what this means for me, and I believe for many other people, is uh, we're getting a tool that's an answer to a struggle. You know, because there is something that I'm struggling my whole life, and that's balance between innovation and creativity and actually being someone who can be commercially and economically viable. Because uh, I have huge respect for you know, the artists that I would classically define most of my life as artists, those people who painstakingly spend every waking moment of their lives of perfecting one single skill. That's amazing. I have huge respect for that. But I'm not that kind of person. And I think most people, you know, in the audiovisual industry are not, are not like that. We're, we want to experiment. We want to adopt. We want, we want to find new ways. You know, we need to express ourselves, be creative. So we're not, you know, spending that time perfecting one single skill. We're spending that time, the same time, with the same passion to adapt a whole skill set. You know, that leads to an original creation, that leads to us having the option to really think very much out of the box and achieve something, something new, you know, where it's, it's pouring our hunger for knowledge and experimenting with new things. And I think that's great, but what's happening is that then, you know, we struggle with finding the balance between actually knowing some skills enough so that we're commercially viable uh, while still actually supplying the hunger that the economy actually has for people like us. You know, the hunger for having somebody who's, you know, up, so up to date, so state of the art and so creative that he actually comes up or they actually come up with new solutions. So finding that balance is really, really hard. And uh, the AI tools are something that I think are helping us with that and helping us achieve that, you know. Uh, but still, it's not creating a single person powerhouse. Again, we did not create a marketing campaign in 90 minutes. We could, but if we had more people, more ideas, you know, more time, uh, um, if, if, if we did it more calmly, Pretty much just as in any other environment, you know. The point is not that like everybody will do that work. It, the point is not that you work alone. So let me leave you with this: uh, the human civilization was granted new technology that, in pretty much only two years, went from generating noise to generating masterpieces that are indistinguishable from being drawn or being written by human master artists. Uh, we get this, this, this tool of creation that was given to anybody in the world, to any lay person. 
You know, now anybody in the world can experience what we as artists do, that they can actually take a piece of, piece of themselves, piece of their soul, their vision, and they can express it, and they can create, and they can see what happens when you put it out on paper or anything else, you know, to make something. You know, that I, th I think that's amazing that we have this tool that's, that's available to everyone suddenly, that gives this power of creation to everybody. Now, but there's this fear that's connected to it. You know, the fear that um, if everybody can create perfection, uh, our art is going to become more lazy. If everybody can create perfection, uh, where's the place for the artists in the world and in the job industry and everywhere else? See, but that's the thing. It's not about hunt for perfection. You know, the, uh, the Japanese have a word for it, wabi-sabi. It's the art of appreciating the imperfect. And I think that social media did show us that uh, in the last six to 10 years, that if you're surrounded by perfection, what actually happens is that the hunger for a per uh, of perfection ceases, that the hunger is for authenticity. Even in, in, uh, uh, even in advertising, we make these you know, polished, great branding marketing campaigns that cost millions. But those are not the campaigns that make money. Those are the campaigns that show who we are. But the campaigns that make money are those that somebody shot on an iPhone in their bathroom without wearing a makeup. Because those are the campaigns they, they say, it's authentic, we have vision, this is who we are. This is what you get. This is what's real. So maybe the creation is really, even with this, even with this perfect tool, is really not about the tool. Maybe it's still about the fact that it needs a certain kind of person with certain dedication and vision and time and, and, and learning to be able to work with the tool and execute the work wisely and efficiently. Maybe it's still about a creator. Maybe it still is about us. Maybe nothing has changed. Thank you. Okay. Yes, of course, if, if, I don't know if you have time, but if you guys have any questions, and if we do have time, I'm absolutely open for some Q&A. But yes, you can take it apart. Uh, if anybody else needs the QR code or anything, 